When you grow up on the south side of Chicago and leave for higher education, you never know where life will lead you. Quite frankly, my mission has been the wait list should be ended. There should be no wait list. That's President and Chief Executive Officer of Gift of Hope Organ and Tissue Donor Network and my friend, Dr. Harry Wilkins. I'm your host, Monica Fox, kidney transplant recipient and Senior Director of Outreach and Government Relations for the National Kidney Foundation of Illinois. On this episode of The Journey Continues, Harry shares how his work has given him the chance to expand the opportunity for donation in Illinois. Hi, Harry. Thanks for joining me today. Monica, good morning, and thanks for having me. Great to be here. How long have you been at Gift of Hope, and where were you before taking this role? As of today, and today is November 8th, it's been four years and I believe 20 days, but who's counting? (laughs) (laughs) Um, Before this, um, on October 6, 2020, was my last day as a practicing trauma surgeon. I think I will be a trauma surgeon until the day I die. But the last day of that I was a practicing trauma surgeon was October 6th of 2020, right in the midst of the pandemic. And I took over this role on October 19th of that same year, so just two weeks later. And I was a trauma surgeon for 36 years practicing prior to taking over this role. So do you have a personal connection to organ donation? I do, actually. Many people who are really, really engaged in this work can tell you their sort of origin story, if you will. And mine goes back to October 26th, 2005. And you might ask, why that specific day? And so what I will tell you is the reason that I point to that day is I've had a lot of time to reflect on that as to why I continue and why I'm so passionate about trying to, quite frankly, end the wait list for those waiting for a life-saving organ. And that is the day, I believe, when it came full force hitting me right in the face. So Monica, what happened was at that time, in October 26, 2005, I had already been practicing as a trauma surgeon for about 15 years. And when you're a trauma surgeon, most of your early years, you spend trying to perfect your craft. And so that was really the main focus. And I happened to go to a conference. Back in those days, there was a big effort to try and tackle the wait list that the uh, CMS sponsored. And it was called the Organ Donation Breakthrough Collaborative. And at that conference, there was a woman, her name is Monica Kirsting, whose daughter was 15 years old when she died waiting for a lung transplant. She told that story, Monica, there were 1,200 healthcare professionals when she told that story. And it was the first time, believe it or not, that I was made aware of the fact that people actually died waiting on an organ. And to that day and since that day, I've been on a mission to make sure that never happened uh, because it was absolutely heart-wrenching. It didn't hurt that that was the day the Chicago White Sox won the World (laughs) Series too. So it's a memorable day (laughs) all in all, but it really does put things in perspective. As memorable as that was as a lifelong White Sox fan that they won the World Series, it really didn't matter at all because that story of Alexa Kirsting, the young woman who died waiting, has stuck with me and has really driven me since that day. And that's amazing because now not many people die waiting for lung transplants. Isn't that correct? Well, it's, it's really interesting. There have been periods of time in the last couple of years when there was nobody on the national wait list for lungs. Yes which is really, really fascinating when you think about it. Alexa, I believe, was the catalyst for getting many people involved in trying to push the boundaries of making more organs available. And as a trauma surgeon at that time, Monica, I knew I had taken care of of patients who, unfortunately, we were unable to save that were young and healthy and otherwise had some sort of massive brain injury, that their lungs were perfectly fine. And I always thought when she was saying that, I know that there were lungs that could have saved her life. And somehow we had to concoct a system or perfect a system to make sure that didn't happen. And within the last couple of years, there's been brief periods of time when we've done that. So there's not a lot of people now, but uh, still there's quite a few people, the majority are waiting on a kidney, but they're dying nonetheless. 
So what is the mission of Gift of Hope? The mission of Gift of Hope is to save and enhance the lives of as many people as possible through organ and tissue donation. And the other 54 organ procurement organizations around the country have similar missions. Our goal is to, to make sure that we maximize the number of available organs that can save lives as well as tissue. So you recently opened a, an organ donor care center at Rush Hospital here in Illinois. How does this center impact organ donation? Well, I don't, I don't know if it comes across on audio, but uh, it just mentioning that just gives me a, a huge smile. I'm extremely proud of that and our team. And the punchline to your question is that what it does is it maximizes the gift. When a family or person has made the gift of donation, and I, I call it a gift because it truly is, when they've made that gift, one organ donor can save up to eight people's lives through organ donation, and countless of lives can be saved from tissue donation. And so what we want to do is maximize that gift. There are times when uh, an individual has said yes to donation, and maybe we're not able to place the heart, or we're not able to place the lungs or the, or the liver. Uh, some of that has to do with just how badly the person is injured or any comorbid conditions. But some of it, Monica, can be modified by how that donor is managed, the medical management of the donor after they've died, but before the organs are procured. So this organ donor care center, the concept is, and I I need to give you this background, in our service area, the service area for Gift of Hope Organ and Tissue Donor Network is the northern three quarters of Illinois in a couple of counties in Northwest Indiana. So we work with 180 hospitals. It covers over 12 million people, and there's 11 transplant centers in our service area. So we get referrals from hospitals all over this area. So when you think about it, we go to these different areas, and the processes at those hospitals are, have variations from one to the other. What this centralized area is, what we've done is we've partnered with Rush University Medical Center on the west side there, and they have created a space that is dedicated to the management and the procurement of those organs, so the care of those donors specifically. What that allows us to do is to standardize the care of those donors so that we can maximize the number of organs that we can get from those donors. So that's, in a nutshell, the purpose of that. Wow. I love it. That is really great. It's really amazing. And it was such a huge lift on our team. And Rush was so great to work with to bring this to fruition. We just opened in September, and we've already seen a a great impact from the numbers of organs, that increased number of organs that we're able to get and, and really save more lives. I mean, this every additional organ we get is another life saved. Um, and we you can't really put a, a price on that, Monica. No, you certainly can't. And I had the opportunity to attend the opening and it's such beautiful space as well. Well, I think if you were there, you probably saw me crack a tear or two because it really was a labor of love. And I think what was so overwhelming to me, Monica, is that as we look at this facility, and again, like you mentioned, it's the only one in Illinois. There's a handful throughout the country but this is really another step we can take to really save lives. And, you know, over the course of my career, you know, yes, as a trauma surgeon, I've had a hand in in saving lives and things of that nature. But at this level, when you sit at the, in the top seat of an organization, when you see something tangible like that, that really makes a difference and can save a life, it's, it's really pretty moving. Yes. Quite moving for those of us watching from the outside as well. So I can't help but wonder, do you foresee having other centers like this in Illinois? Right now, again, we're so early into this. I think that as we see this evolve and we see what the needs are, because right now we've got a really good capacity there at Rush. Uh, We've certainly not exceeded that. When we talked about this center, as we see see the growth of it and see what the potential is, certainly we're open to the uh, possibility of doing that. 
I don't see that right now, but I certainly wouldn't discount it. If the need arose, I think for sure we would want to do that. So you mentioned that people are still dying, waiting for kidneys, which we know. What's the current wait in Illinois for a deceased donor kidney? That's a great question, and I'd have to get back to you on that. I will give you this answer, though. Whatever it is, it's too long. The reason I say that is because I posit this to people who are not on dialysis and who are not uh, suffering from kidney disease. But I guess give them this question, is that if you went to a doctor and the doctor told you that your kidneys are failing and you need a transplant, I simply ask them the question, what is a reasonable amount of time to wait for that transplant? Nobody says three months or three years. But these are the types of weights that we're seeing. And so to me, again, I don't know right off the top of my head what the wait time is. But if you're the one waiting for a kidney, it's too long. Sure. It's definitely too long. As someone who waited for three years on dialysis, that was too long. I was wondering if you were going to mention that because you of all people, Monica, I know your story. You of all people can identify with that comment because as you were waiting for your kidney, did you really care what the average wait list for a group of people were? No, I didn't. No, it didn't matter. You cared about yours. Yeah. So my goal, and I'm, you know, I'm a surgeon, so I'm a pretty simple guy. <laughs> my goal is, you asked what the mission of Gift of Hope is, but since October 26, 2005, quite frankly, my mission has been the wait list should be ended. There should be no wait list. I agree. We're on the same team with that. Now, that brings me to one question. There's a lot of conversation about there being too many discarded organs. Has there been anything that Gift of Hope has been able to do to address this issue? There's a number of different things. So there's the management side of it. And when we look at all the discarded organs, and again, there is a lot of discarded organs. And anytime you think about uh, discarding organs, that's that's a gift that goes unused. There are some that are really just medically not in a good enough position to be donated, right? Think about a 70-year-old man with hypertension and diabetes and stage four kidney disease, which means he's not quite on dialysis, but probably needing dialysis himself. Those kidneys are are, are not medically suitable to give to someone who needs a kidney. And there, there certainly are some of those. But Monica, we also know that there are kidneys that are much better than anyone who's on dialysis that could certainly be used. One transplant surgeon said it to me very well. He goes, we know that not all kidneys are suitable for all patients, but we know that most of those kidneys are suitable for some of those patients. And what that then comes down to is a very complex algorithm for allocating organs equitably that takes time. And what happens is as the kidneys have gotten out of the body for a prolonged period of time, the longer they're out of the body, the lower the quality of that kidney becomes. So if you have a hard to place kidney and then you take a lot more time to place it, those kidneys have a higher risk of going unused. So there's logistical issues and then there's medical management issues. So some of the things that we try to do is number one, we try first of all by UNOS, and many people don't know this, but we don't decide unilaterally who gets an organ. That's a complex algorithm that's decided by the United Network on Organ Sharing. When kidney transplant programs rank their recipients, and then the organ procurement organization, when we look at a donor, we plug in the characteristics of the donor, their age, their kidney function, weight, sex, all those things. We plug that into the computer, and then their match, they run a list of who is matched for that organ. And that's a fair and equitable, equitable way to do that. And so we follow that match list. Say the first person on the list, we've sent the offer out to them. They have some time to evaluate that. If they don't want that kidney, then we go to the next one. Now we can do this electronically so that it doesn't take as much time. But
but we have to go through that process. As that time goes further and further and further along, we then start doing what we call expedited offers. We know that it's getting late in the stage, so we start calling our local centers and anybody who might be able to use this kidney before it goes to waste. And we do that for every kidney. And so those are logistical issues that we try to look at. In addition to trying to do different things to the donor, make sure the blood pressure is good, make sure the oxygen level is good so that the kidneys are in the best shape they can to be used. And then the transplant centers are doing the same thing on their side. So there's this complex set of logistical issues and medical issues that have to be navigated. And those are the things that we really, really work on. We have coordinators on the transplant side and on the gift of hope side to make sure that we can try and match those organs as best we can. Sounds very complex. And then on the end of those that are waiting, you're just waiting for that call. It is. And um, I think that you, Monica, are probably best suited to talk about the frustrations that people who are on the other end waiting on that call. And, you know, as as doctors and as people in organ procurement organizations and people on the transplant side, we feel that frustration as well because we get to know these people. I was just mentioning her yesterday. We had a longtime employee here, just the sweetest woman. She would actually come three days a week from the south side of Chicago all the way up to Itasca. She was the, um, the receptionist at our front desk. And she was on dialysis and she was on the wait list and we would see her every day. And she was the face of Gift of Hope. She was the first person that you greeted. And several years ago, she died waiting for an organ that we never got. It's always been very painful to me to think that here's a woman who worked at a place whose goal it is to get organs for people. She needed one herself. And, you know, Monica, that feels like a failure. And in many ways, it is. Yeah, I, I understand. How do you support donor families? We try to meet donor families where they are. You know, as you know, everyone grieves differently. All families are different. But donor families have different needs. There are some donor families that we have encountered that they just, for whatever reason, they just don't want to talk about it. It's too painful for them. And we give them their space. I would think the majority of families that I've encountered, and maybe it's just because those are the ones that, that work with us the most, the main thing that they want is to make sure that no one forgets their loved one. That's what they tell us over and over again is that their biggest fear is that their loved one would be forgotten. And through organ donation, one of the things that's great is oftentimes, not all the time, but oftentimes families will, first of all, they do hear the general outcome of what happened with their loved one's organ. And the beautiful thing, Monica, is sometimes they get a chance to meet the people or at least hear from the people whose lives their loved one has saved. And what families tell me, you know, I'm not a, a donor family, I'm not a, a donor dad, but what families tell me is that it is the most fulfilling thing that helps them heal from their grieving. It's never a replacement, Monica, it's never a replacement but it gives them such a sense of peace and happiness and joy is the word I mostly hear is joy, that their loved one's gift has meant that someone else has been able to live. So we do memory making, we have the transplant games, we have donor family events. There's numerous things. We've got an ambassador program where families once they know what organ donation has done for them and their loved ones, they want to share that with others. They want to let others know what good donation does because one of the things that I've found about organ donation, and it certainly happened to me, is oftentimes unless it has impacted you directly or indirectly through someone you know, someone you love, it's not really on your radar. Donor families tell you that they belong to a club that they would never have joined voluntarily. But now, having been in that group, they now know the value that it gives to them in terms of healing. And so we oftentimes take the lead of what families want from us. Uh, we have a donor 
family aftercare team that's just absolutely wonderful. They've got the biggest hearts in the world. They form bonds with these folks. We do a number of things to support donor families because as one of the donor moms on our board has always said, donation doesn't happen without the donor family. That's absolutely true. So how do you impact the lives of recipients and those waiting for transplant? It's kind of inherent in our name. It's Gift of Hope. So if you're someone who's waiting for an organ, it's got to be of some comfort, and you can probably speak to this, to know that there is there are organizations that are dedicated 24-7 to this work, to that to know that we're doing everything that we can to make sure that someone who is waiting on an organ, someone's out there waiting to try, working to try and get one. And so I think that's how we impact the recipients, because if you're out there waiting for an organ and you know, prior to organ procurement organizations existing, you were really kind of up to yourself to try and say, hopefully your transplant center might happen upon someone who might be a suitable donor. But to know that there's an organization out there working 24-7 to try and, and get an organ for you does give a modicum of hope. It is, however, pretty discouraging if week after week and month after month and year after year, you're still languishing, waiting for that organ. And then once we are able to get an organ and it gets transplanted, we tend to try to celebrate that as much as we can, celebrate the recipient. And we have a relationship with all the transplant centers so that we can know what their success rates are and and celebrate with them when they're able to transplant a recipient. Yes, and it's certainly a celebration. I know because my eight-year anniversary is coming up. November 22nd. Oh, your new birthday. Yes, yes. That's a day that uh, is very, very special. Yeah, the donorversary. Yes, yes. So what's the main message that you want people to know about organ donation? Just how impactful organ donation is. We oftentimes talk about the number of organ transplants we do or the number of organ donors that we have in a year. Those are some of the metrics that we use to to evaluate whether we're successful or not. But Monica, it really doesn't capture the number of lives that are impacted. Because even in your case, so in the eight years that you've had your extended life with your donation, think about your daughter, your grandchild, your extended family and friends. Those lives are also impacted in a domino effect, in a ripple effect. Absolutely. And so, for instance, last year, Gift of Hope was successful in facilitating 509 donor families. However, each one of those donors had a wide-ranging impact. And then we had over 1,400 organs that were transplanted all over the country, and those families were impacted. So it really is an immeasurable impact that organ donation has. And again, it all starts with the donor. You and I don't know when our ticket will be punched and we leave this earth. But for me, as a registered organ donor, when I leave this earth, if I have usable organs, everybody in my family and my friends know, take whatever you can use because I won't need them where I'm going. And so if we could have everyone registered to be an organ donor, we would be able to save so many lives and could probably wipe out the wait list. Right now, from studies, we know that about 95% of the population support organ donation, yet only about 65% of the United States population are registered organ donors. And one of the things that we know that is if someone dies in a manner that will allow them to be an organ donor, if they are a registered donor, then the family knows their uh, wishes, they have made their wishes known, and we're much more successful in moving forward with donation. It's when someone dies and the family doesn't know their wishes and they haven't registered to be a donor, if the family is not willing to move forward, then whether that person isn't eligible to be a donor or not, We can't move forward without the family's consent. And that decreases the amount of available organs. The message I would have would be twofold is number one, understand the impact that organ donation has, not just on the recipient, but as we talked about before, our families have told us 
how impactful this is to their lives. The second message would be to register as an organ donor yourself. We are always pushing the boundaries with medical advances in terms of the age of donors that we can take, patients who have other diseases that would normally have precluded organ donation. We can now successfully transplant organs from those patients and uh, have very good outcomes. Some examples include donors that have HIV. Hepatitis C donors used to be an absolute contraindication. It used to be age was a restriction. And recently we've had a liver transplant from an 85-year-old donor. And so we're continually making medical advances. And so people who would feel that, well, maybe they wouldn't want my organs, I wouldn't be so quick to say that. I would say be an organ donor. However old you are, register to be an organ donor. Awesome. Well, I think that about sums it up. And this has been a fantastic Mm -hmm. conversation. I thank you so much for sharing your knowledge and expertise with us today. Thank you, Monica. I appreciate that. I appreciate all the work you do. You didn't say this in your comments, but uh, I know that because Oregon, you didn't realize that you even needed a kidney (laughs) before you um, became uh, ill. And I know that you do a lot of work with the National Kidney Foundation of Illinois. And I know part of that is because you want to give back to people who um, are in your position as well. So thank you for what you do. Oh, it is my pleasure. And it definitely is a blessing and a gift to be able to give back and do this work and to work alongside with brilliant people like you and other colleagues. So thank you so much. Great. Thank you, Monica. By registering to be an organ donor, you're committing to save lives. By advocating for organ donation, you're helping others to make the same powerful choice. For more information on deceased organ donation and the work that Dr. Harry Wilkins is doing with the Gift of Hope, go to giftofhope.org. I'm Monica Fox, and this is The Journey Continues. Prevention is a key part of our mission at the Kidney Foundation. That's why at the end of each episode, we share a health tip. Here's today's nutrition tip about kidney stones. It's estimated that one in 10 people will have a kidney stone at some point in their lifetime. A kidney stone is a hard object that is made from the chemicals in urine. There are five different types of kidney stones, calcium oxalate, calcium phosphate, uric acid, struvite, and cysteine. Calcium oxalate stones are the most common type of kidney stone and are created when calcium combines with oxalate in the urine. Inadequate calcium and fluid intake, along with other conditions, may contribute to their formation. Calcium phosphate stones are less common but are caused by similar things as calcium oxalate stones. Uric acid is another common type of kidney stone and often occurs with high consumption of purine-rich foods like organ meats and shellfish over a period of time. High purine intake increases the production of monosodium urate, which may form stones in the kidney. And while it's okay to consume these foods in moderation, be cautious of excessive regular consumption if you may be at risk for the development of uric acid kidney stones. Struvite kidney stones are less common and are caused by an infection in your upper urinary tract. Finally, cysteine stones tend to be rare and are hereditary. Common symptoms of kidney stones include severe pain in your lower back, blood in your urine, nausea, vomiting, fever, and chills, or urine that smells bad or looks cloudy. If you have any of these symptoms, it's important to follow up with your healthcare provider. Want to reduce your risk for developing a kidney stone? Follow these tips. Drink fluids to keep your urine less concentrated with waste products. Aim for 12 glasses a day. Water is best and sugar-sweetened beverages should be limited. Eat lots of fruits and vegetables in order to make urine that is less acidic. When your urine is less acidic, it will be more difficult for stones to form. Reduce excess salt in your diet and make sure you meet the minimum recommended daily allowance of 1,000 milligrams of calcium a day to prevent kidney stones. Try to get this through food as calcium supplements tend to increase kidney stone risk. With today's nutrition tip, I'm Melissa Prest, a registered dietitian nutritionist 